But the fact that when you're rolling down a ramp, I don't want to write it the same way. I want to talk about the fact that it's the center of mass of the objects that's moving. There's not some option for what R is going to be here. If it rolls, it rolls about its outside radius of curvature. It's a ball. It's a, it's a hoop. It's a, it's a disc. Yes, sir. <laughs> I think this is hard. Um, I think it's hard for students to understand this. So I, I, I think it's easy to lay it out, but I think it's hard for students to understand it. I, I want you to remember the reason why the object takes a long time to make it downwards, or at least more so than an object that's just sliding. Because the object was just sliding, this would be the unbalanced force down the ramp. Empty sign theta. But an object that is rolling is experiencing a frictional force. The linear part of Newton's second law doesn't get violated because the object is spinning. This still must be true. So the net force here is still equal to MA. So the object that rolls down to the bottom will take longer than the object that slides down to the bottom if there's no friction. Now, the first argument, well, doesn't that take energy away from the system? There's friction acting. This is static friction. And the answer is no. If the object were sliding, it would be kinetic friction. And the work done by kinetic friction would be negative because the object would be moving this way and the force would be this way. And the definition of work would make that work negative. But when it comes to static friction, it's a little different. This point is not moving with respect to the surface. So this frictional force, by definition, can't do negative work. What does it do? It ends up being a positive torque. It is the frictional force that causes the rotation. So it's doing rotational work. It's causing a change in the rotational kinetic energy. Now, that doesn't take energy away from the system, but it does change the velocity of the object. So I'm, a, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but there is something to be said for trying to take a little bit of care in considering what's happening. And I'm gonna start with a simple example. We're still talking about a, 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 um, a round object rolling down a ramp. But now we have to explore the force portion of that problem. We explored the energy portion before. Now let's explore the force portion. And in setting this problem up, I don't want to do all of the translational calculations again. And what I mean by that is if this is a object of mass M, then I know that in the X direction, Mg sine theta minus static friction is equal to MA. I, I don't need to do all of the force diagrams and put the, the X and the Y on there. Can, we have to be able to go to this point now. And, and further, I think I can say that, you know, we are in agreement, normal force equals MG cosine theta. So here's my theta, this is my, my ramp, and this is my object on there. The, the problem, is that if this were sliding down the ramp, then we would be talking about kinetic friction. This object is rolling down the ramp. In the past, we might be compelled to think we could use something about static friction, but I wanna remind you that we really can't. This is a condition that exists, but as a condition goes, it's an inequality. I really don't know how much friction it takes for an object to roll, let alone if there's enough available to cause it to roll. This is what is missing in your notes, this little nuance. So, so let me talk about that nuance again so that you understand why I, I want you to, to really under, look at this. This tells me how much friction is available. 
it does not tell me how much friction is required. Now, I think we could probably use the rules of physics to find out how much friction is required and therefore what the acceleration of my system is. Now, the truth is I, don't, I wouldn't need to do that. I know we know how fast it's going at the bottom of the ramp. I could probably use a motion equation, but I think you guys need to be able to do this. So you have taken great care now to draw a nice clear diagram I would encourage you now to do what I'm going to do, which is to draw in the forces that are acting on this object, but to draw them where they occur. Don't draw this like a free body diagram. Draw this so that you know the forces are acting at the point of application of each force. And yes, they have required this on the exam. So an easy example is I'm going to draw in the, the one that's you know super easy to do, gravity. There it is but I want to be careful and try and get it to the center of that circle. Now, you are probably aware there's two other forces here. Can you draw them in? Yeah. A ball on a ramp. Yeah, we're still doing the ball on the ramp. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time waiting. Uh, I think we, we can do this. Normal force has to be perpendicular to the surfaces in contact. which suggests that the normal force would be acting along a diameter like so, and would point right through the center of my object. It has to act at that single point of contact between the rolling object and the surface. So because of that, this has to be pointed straight through the center. That's important because that means the normal force can't cause a torque. Since a normal force acts straight towards the center, it can't cause a torque. Now, I'm sure some of you are ahead of me and drew the frictional force in. But you might want to add a little something to your notes here. The direction of friction is not obvious. The direction of friction is conditional for the same reason why when we slid something up a ramp or something slid down a ramp you had to consider what the direction of friction was based on the motion of the object this is going to be a little bit more difficult to understand because this is static friction would friction be up or down the ramp if this thing was rolling down the ramp and you applied the brakes like what if this is the the front wheel of a bicycle and you're already moving and you tried to slam on the brakes. Well, what direction would friction act then? Are you sure you know? What if this was rolling up the ramp? What direction would friction act? Now, it's, it's not hard to understand. Friction opposes motion. So generally, if we know that this thing is rolling down the ramp, it is very likely that your intuition will work. Just be cautious and thoughtful before you just arbitrarily assign a direction to friction. What will be the direction that the friction is causing the wheel to turn? If you think about that, you'll do better. Okay, so if I want to know, say, the acceleration of this system, I would be unable to do so by just looking at forces. Because forces is this stuff right here in the top, and you'll notice too many unknowns. If I know the mass and the angle and G, I still can't get acceleration. Torque is probably a way to get the acceleration, but there's a problem with the torque argument. 
one that you're not prepared to hear about. This problem can be solved more than one way when it comes to torque. There's me using the center of the wheel as the pivot point, or me using the actual pivot point, which is the point of contact between the ball and the ramp. One of those is the actual pivot and one's not. The point of contact is the actual pivot. But in my head, the center of the ball feels like the right pivot. The truth is it doesn't matter which pivot point we choose to use. I know it feels like it should, but the reason we can choose either one of those is because there is no fixed point in space. The pivot keeps moving. And because of that, we don't have to pick a specific pivot point. But of the available pivot options, these are the two. Now, I don't care which way we do this. Third period, we did this one. Fourth period, which I recorded, but it didn't work, we did this one. So you guys are the tiebreakers. Which pivot point do you want to choose to look at? Pivot point one or pivot point two? Just hold up a finger. I don't have my glasses on, so I have no idea. I'm seeing twos and ones. Okay. Um, since this is third period and I have sufficient time to say this, pivot point one by itself can give us the acceleration of the system in one line. Pivot point two can give us an expression for friction in one line. Each has an advantage. So it doesn't matter. You, you pick one and that's good. But if we use pivot point one, we can get the acceleration of the system in a single line. If we choose pivot point two, we can get the frictional force in a single line. So I think in the next 60 seconds, I can show both. So let's do pivot point two, net torque. And we're using pivot point two here. That has to equal I alpha. And by the way, I'm just going to leave it I. That way you can put in whatever object you want. You can put a ball in there, whatever in there, whatever in there. So um, if I use pivot point two, um, gravity is acting at pivot point two, so it is not a torque, right? Because that force acts at the pivot point. And the normal force is pointing directly at the pivot point, so the angle for the sine is zero. So the only thing that's actually causing a pivot is friction. Everybody see that? And it is at a right angle to the torque arm. So when I look at the size of that torque, it'll be R times the frictional force equals I times A over R. Now I left it in terms of I and I'm gonna do one more thing. I'm gonna collect the R's. So if I divide both sides by R, that makes this R squared. And I just want to write it like this. Now, yes, this does tell me the frictional force, but it only tells me the frictional force if I know the acceleration. But I will point out if I substitute it right here, I can get rid of the frictional force and get an expression for the acceleration. Everybody see that okay? Also, please notice, will the radius of the ball or disc or ring matter? Do you notice what's, what is going on right here? That there's an R squared that's gonna cancel out any R squared? Right, we just talked about the fact that all of our circular objects are something mr squared. So what's going to be left there is just something times m. The r squares will cancel. The radius does not matter. That's a weird thing on its own, but it's true. So I'm just going to let that hang there for a minute. And, and here's why. Let's do net torque about pivot point one. 
this is the part that's hard. Um, if I do net torque about pivot point one, uh, parallel axis formula, because I've shifted it from the center of mass to the edge. Oh, my, Mr. Shelton, such an egregious mistake there. Better? Do you see what I've done? The moment of inertia isn't just I. I put the parallel axis formula in there, already shifting it from the center to the edge by putting R squared there. And just doing that thing where I had to do the substitution. Okay, so now I need the torque. The torque is torque arm length. So torque arm length will be this R. Force will be the weight, mg. And now I need the sine of the angle, sine of this angle, which is theta. OK, so that's going to equal. Kind of painting myself in the corner here. I center of mass plus m r squared times a over r. Okay, so I know you don't see it yet, so let me let me paint you a better picture. Do you mind if I divide both sides by r? It gets rid of this r and adds the square right there. Is that okay? Now this part you have to follow. I need everybody's attention, so you don't say, Miss Shelton, where'd that come from? I'm going to distribute the R squared inside the parentheses. Everybody okay? So when I do that, I will get I center of mass divided by R squared plus M all times A equals M G sine theta. Everybody see it okay? Just make sure, check my algebra. I know my algebra's right. Okay, we're all collected, so I, I gotta do it now. You, you should know what I'm about to do. The unbalanced force for the object is still gravity. And that has to equal the inertia of the system times the acceleration of the system. I can, I will. I did. But you see it, right? The torque equation by itself reproduced Newton's second law, but it did so in a manner that gave us the entire inertia of the system. Now, just so you know, if you had, if you had done this substitution and eliminated that, you would get the exact same formula. It's exactly the same as if you just eliminated this, the, the static frictional force. But like I said, you would get the acceleration in one line, and we did. Now, there's lots I want to say about what's going on here, but we don't have the time for all of it. So here's what you need to take away from this. First, no matter which method you choose, there is a clear way to get the acceleration of the system, either here or here. It's a clear way to get the acceleration of the system. The static friction has a requirement. This is how much friction is required. There's no way around it. That's how much friction is required. You solve for A, plug it in there, but this is how much friction you have. Now, we covered a lot of ground today in a relatively short time. We are gonna pick this up and finish on Monday. Did I express that when you have a merry-go-round, I won't notice that you didn't turn your sound down.
So uh, what I want to remember and remind us is that each of those horses has a different tangential velocity, right? That's, I want to make sure I emphasize that. And we would say, you know, this one's the slowest, next fastest, next fastest, next fastest, and certainly the most fastest. And so when we talk about those horses, the reason why you put younger passengers on the inside isn't just because the horses are going slower. It's so that they can hold on easier because there's also something else going on here. The whole thing has the same angular speed, but it takes more and more force to hold on the more you get closer to the edge, right? This is the centripetal acceleration. If you want to travel around in that circle, you have to apply an unbalanced force that is at least equal to that centripetal acceleration. It's directly proportional to how far away from the center you are. Double how far away from the center you are, you have to hold on with twice as much force. So, yeah, you put the little kids on the inside. That way, if they do fall, they fall into the ride. They don't get flung off into space. And I want to you know, contrast that 